congratulations, gentlemen, for the re-release of All About Evil. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, amazing. I, I, I can't believe I missed this the first time around, but I guess this is uh, before I was like really knee deep into this industry. So it's a, uh, it's very entertaining. What, what is it? Was it this uh, cult film this entire time? <laughs> well, I mean, it, it was definitely, you know, one of those movies that when it came out, obviously you can't set out to make a cult film that doesn't really work, even though I'm in the business of cult films and I love cult films. You know, I made uh, this movie uh, because this is the movie I wanted to make. And um, we released it in a way that um, was unusual. And I think part of the fact that it is transgressive and bizarre and has all the elements of a cult film and stars a lot of people who've been in other cult movies you know it did it did kind of take on this mystique as it was being withheld from the public over the years right because you know a lot of people who saw it talked about it said they loved it then people who hadn't seen it were pissed off that they couldn't find it you know couldn't see it so i guess in a way it, unintentionally it, it, it might have helped you know to withhold it you know so yeah, it's, it's a strange story. Well, I mean, uh, this re reissue, now everyone's gonna find it. So I <laughs> guess that, that's the entire purpose of a reissue. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. I'm, I'm very excited about who's uh, doing the reissue because I think both Severn Films and uh, Shudder are exactly the audience. They have exactly the audience that this movie you know, wants. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to those folks seeing it. So Thomas, way back then when you first got the script, well, first of all, how did you get this script and what what was your initial reaction? What, what kind of movie you thought this was gonna be? I mean, full disclosure, I think I wanted to do it before I'd even read the script. And it was brought to me by Darren Stein, the producer of the movie, one of the producers. And I'd known Darren for some time and he had, I just remember him calling me and saying, oh my God, have you heard of Peaches Christ? And I said, no, who's that? And he launched into this whole thing about how brilliant Peaches is and, um, and Joshua is. And, and then I saw all of Joshua's shorts, one of which was the kind of launch pad for this, for the feature version. And um, I just instantly, it was just, it's everything that I love. It's everything that interests me. It's horror, it's queer, it's camp, it's edgy, it's bizarre, it pushes boundaries. It was, it was just everything I wanted to be doing at 21 years old. And, um, and so then I met Joshua and we, I feel, instantly understood each other. And, um, and then I read the script and it was, I loved it. I loved the script. Uh, I love the movie. I mean, I just, yeah. So it was kind of a, there was, from the moment I knew of Joshua and his world and the possibility that I could be a part of it, it was like, that was it. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Joshua, or, or should I call you Peaches? I'm, I'm, I'm always like born, torn, uh, you know, both ways. But uh, now this all started from your short film Grindhouse. What nightmares oh. did you actually get to, uh, to do that? Or is it all stemmed from, you know, that immersive theater experience um, over the years? It, it actually... Um was, uh, God, I mean, it's that thing where I was always a kid who just loved horror movies and grew up loving horror movies and, um, and anything, anything weird or spooky. So haunted attractions, haunted houses, all of that stuff. So, um, yeah, all about evil in a way being, um, the, the feature film that Grindhouse, um, was, you know, the short film, um, all that stuff is just, God, it's so, it's so, much a part of my DNA as far as like it being the stuff that I love and um yeah I don't know I mean it, it, it's it's a uh, yeah it's 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 an interesting time for me as far as wh why I made Grindhouse I actually made Grindhouse because all the other stuff I was doing was Peaches Christ centered and so I wanted to create a story with original characters that weren't revolving around myself or the drag characters that I was working with and um yeah and so I just sort of challenged myself and that's where Deborah Tanise came from. Wow Thomas um you know as a 21 year old who starred in a film like this I mean this kind of marks like the beginning of your career in its own way 
Did, did anything else ever top this, or you, or you, or you kind of proud that th this is how you got started in the, you know, sort of like in the industry? Well, I'd been acting for a very long time already, but I, it was my first indie, and it was my first non, you know, network studio TV mainstream bullshit thing, and um, so it was really the kind of awakening of myself as. It was, it was the first time I felt like, oh, I can actually do this job that I've had since I was a child, but actually do it in environments and spaces and projects that thrill me. This isn't, and I think that was the first time as an adult. And that whole year that followed it and was kind of, an, it just kind of continued to be that way. So um, All About Evil definitely felt like kind of the declaration of where I wanted to go in my career, you know, and um, yeah. Yeah, and it, it, but also it just as a personal experience was so crucial to my development as a as a human. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I like I like it how uh, a horror horror film like this is crucial development. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I think I think one of the things that was really um, interesting for me and and I I, I, I realized now being you know, close with other filmmakers and of course actors like Thomas who, who've who done many, many um, TV shows and movies is I came from a very tight underground world, right? Like we, we're very underground in terms of being drag performers and horror makers and, you know, um, and so my my concept of, 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 of you know, a community was very different than what would be Hollywood or, or the, the industry. And so when I met Thomas on the set of a t big multi-billion dollar Terminator TV show where he's playing John Connor and I'm saying, will you come be in my little movie? I remember bonding with him so clearly because I remember being like, wait, I'm, I'm this freak, this weirdo. If he's on this big Hollywood set, but I could tell he was one of us. He, he like needed to come and do this movie in San Francisco. And I don't know how to explain it other than that. And then of course, you know, like Thomas has become a member of my family and, you know, we've, we've um, stayed close and, and not just Thomas, but the other, uh, the, the whole cast in a way of all of any of you. And I know people say this, they work on movies and they say, oh, it was like, we became like a family. And I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> this movie, it's almost weird. You know, like we, we really did become a family for each other. And most families that are made on movie sets dwindle within one to two years max. Our, yeah. all of our bond has continued to this day. Like, yeah. it's kind of wild. Well, that is, that is, that is really awesome. <laughs> um, I mean, call me traditionalist. I like the practical effects in horror movies rather than CGI effects. Uh, Joshua, could you talk about uh, doing that in, the challenges with practical effects. And Thomas, I know, I know you've done, you know, projects like Sarah Chronicle where it has like some guy. You could chime in with the with this. <laughs> no, you go, Joshua, with it. Well, I think that, yeah, uh, we we um definitely knew going into it that I wanted all practical effects wherever possible. And so, I mean, obviously we didn't really push Natasha off of a building, um, you know, so there, there is some CGI in there, you know, we got our diehard moment of her falling, but the CGI is very uh, limited, especially where the gore is concerned. You know, the, the, the whole movie is sort of this love letter to people like Herschel Gordon Lewis and Doris Wishman, who, you know, they used, cow tongues and you know all sorts of weird things to make fake blood and you know i wanted that juicy um you know feeling of the the practical effects and the puppets and the 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 actors engaging with um real stuff um and so yeah it was it was completely by design and even to this day i don't think cgi even all these years later when i see cgi blood splatter in a movie it totally takes me out of the moment to the point where i'm like really you couldn't have just you know <laughs> thrown some blood on the wall like you know they, they it hasn't gotten good enough yet where it's believable <laughs> what, what what about for you tom is acting between you know practical and cgi Practical is always better, in my opinion. I mean, in my opinion, as an actor, as a director, and as a movie watcher, it's just anything more tangible and 
done in camera. It's just, I think it hits you more as a viewer, it reaches you more. But yeah, as an actor, it's, um, I mean, I love doing gory shit. It's like, <laughs> Steven in this barely, like I barely get to interact with any gore really. I think most of the really arduous, difficult stuff like sewing Mink's mouth shut and all of that shit, I wasn't present for. I just got to enjoy watching in the finished, in the finished cut. But, um, yeah, and of course, like the, the, uh, as the uh, filmmaker, both Thomas and I know um, that, that there's also the downside. It's more expensive. Stuff like sewing Mink's mouth shut or Mink ripping her mouth open. Um, you know, like if you have to do a second take, woo, you know, that's huge amounts of money and time, you know. So there is a reason, there is a really good practical reason to not do these effects, but I think they're so worth it. Joshua, you you still have all these uh, you know body parts and stuff, and after all these years, or or is it long gone and tossed away now? Uh, well, a, a lot of the body parts for the movie, um, ironically, were sent to us from LA by a studio, um, an effects studio. Oh God, do you remember their name, Thomas? Um, it's the same um, guy who does all of Guillermo del Toro's stuff, and he has a huge huge studio down in LA and Darren Stein was friends with them. And Perfect? I went to their... Or Nicotero or? No, no, Michael. Anyway, he did yeah. all the, he did Hellboy and he did Pan's yeah. Labyrinth. And like, I went to their studio and anyway, they couldn't, they couldn't help us other than they, they said, cause they were way out of our, you know, budget, <laughs> but like they sent up a ton of body parts. And so a lot of the body parts that are in the movie are actually from other movies that we were borrowing. Um, but stuff I do have, like the guillotine that I bought, you know, that they had rented, you know, from a prop house. Um, and I decided I needed that guillotine. So I bought it. Um, you know, I, I still have that. And I do, I, I put that guillotine in every show I do um, <laughs> uh, uh, over at the San Francisco Mint for my terror vault haunted attraction. <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah it was a good investment <laughs> there we go thomas i i know it's, it, it is almost kind of sad you didn't get into the goriest scenes but you were challenged in this as i was watching i was like gosh you do so much running and dodging <laughs> throughout this entire movie it did was, i i always say that the closing like sequence at the victoria which is what joshua like 20 minutes 25? yeah yeah 25 minutes probably you know our version of the the prom scene and carrie it felt like it felt like it was one of those things where it was just like this is never going to end we are never going to have all of this in the can and i mean i can't imagine for you being in charge of all of it because there were just so many moving parts all over the theater and so many extras and like it that chunk yeah it did feel like a lot of me running around worried and yelling and trying to save everybody but that's kind of par for the course with most roles I get, it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's very appropriate for, uh, for a horror film. <laughs> well, let, me, let me ask first, uh, um, Joshua Peaches here. Uh, you know, it's, it's been a while since this movie, you know, since uh, you, you directed. And movies like this, you always open up for a sequel. Why haven't we have a sequel for All About Evil? Well, I'm 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 not sure that a sequel um, might be uh, in order, but I would love to make another movie, um, and I certainly have ideas for movies that are in the universe that All About Evil is in. Um, so, yeah, my uh, one one thing I would love is if if the momentum or the excitement around this movie coming out, not to mention all of the sort of um, interest suddenly years later in quote unquote queer horror, um, you know, it's like, okay, yeah, write me a check. I'd love to make another movie. You know, I'm, I'm over here, I'm ready to go. And, you know, pr I've proven I, I, I can make a, 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 a movie, um, you know, so, so yeah, I hope that I get to make another one. That would be lovely. <laughs> and Thomas, what's, what's not next up for you? Po possibly get queer horror down the road again? Well, actually, yeah, I, uh, I have a film that I'm going to make that I'm in the kind of the steps of right before funding, hopefully, that is very much a queer horror, I suppose one would call it. Um, and uh, so I'm looking forward to that. I'm writing a lot right now for work. I have a Paramount movie coming out in the fall called Little Dixie, 
that's for a director I've worked with a couple times now. So I'm excited for that. And I just had a show come out called Swimming with Sharks that I'm quite proud of. I'm See, that, that's, that's terrific. Oh yeah, it's fun. It's uh, good, and, good and fucked up. Um, and yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And, and Joshua, I just want to toss out one last question here. Uh, Jack, Jack Donner was such an iconic character oh. in, in, in this film. Um, I, I want to know is uh, when you directed him, did you ask him to play the character in a certain way or was that all Jack with his, you know, his snickering and his, uh, his movements, his laughter and everything? It's all Jack. I mean, it, he actually was frustrated because he said that he needed more guidance from me. And I kept saying, I'm not, I don't want you to change anything. <laughs> like, like <laughs> no, no, no. Everything he was doing, I mean, it, I don't remember. I think they did on the Blu-ray, on the Severn Blu-ray in the featurette that they have, they included the clip of Jack's audition. Jack actually came in and auditioned for the movie. And we had seen all these different people. You'll see, Thomas, when you see the featurette, because I got to see it. Um, they, they show different people doing Mr. Twigs, and then they show Jack. And it was immediate. Like, as soon as he walked in the room and started performing, I looked at the casting director, and I was like, uh, I had no idea at that time that Jack Donner was this accomplished actor. I just knew that he blew me away in the audition. And um, yeah, Jack was magical. And as Thomas knows, he was so easy, so sweet, so lovely. And he would just, you know, just show up on the set and be ready to go. And, and when the cameras were rolling and I said, action, everything you saw, that was just pure Jack Donner. And what a game actor at his age to be throwing himself on the floor and doing all this shit. I mean, and he never, as far as I saw, never complained or griped or, you know, just lovely. He was, <laughs> you know, when he made All About Evil, he was in his 80s. Yeah. You know, um, he was amazing, just wonderful. And then, you know, of course, we all fell in love with him and got to know him. And, um, you know, he would tell us these mo the most incredible stories. Like, I didn't know when he showed up to do the movie. It was actually Julie... Uh, Caitlin Brown, who plays the stepmother, who had been on one of the Star Trek um, series, um, uh, who said, oh, that's, you know, Jack Donner has been in every incarnation of Star Trek, <laughs> like since its inception. He's the only actor who's shown up in every series, every version. It's like, I had no idea, you know, he's, he's amazing. Well, everyone's amazing in this cast. I do have to admit, everyone's a freak and psycho in their own way. In <laughs> yes. Yeah, in every performance. So, you know, cro cross crossing figures, you know, even though it's been a while, let's have, let's have some more. Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joshua. Peaches. Yeah. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank I appreciate you. appreciate this conversation. Thanks, Thank you. Gary. Have a good time. Yeah.